All right, welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to admit a couple more people and then we can get started. All right, um, thanks so much everyone for joining us. My name is Maria Ferguson. I'm the curator here at the Roger Tory Peterson Institute in Jamestown, New York. Um, I'm also joined by Madeline Card, our learning and engagement coordinator for this program today. And we are thrilled to welcome photographer David Cook today. Uh, David was one of 15 artists who was featured in the 2022 Art That Matters to the Planet exhibition here at RTPI. And today he will present a virtual talk about his art practice as a nature photographer, including his inspirations and techniques, and a behind the scenes look at his avian apparition series of bird photography, which explores the artistry of birds in flight. So for more information about David Cook, you can visit his website, davidjcookphotography.com. I will add that to the chat for those of you who are interested. Um, and also, because I know that everyone will be very inspired after listening to David's talk today, um, I'd like to let you know that he will also be partnering with us again in March to teach a series of four classes on expressive bird photography. The courses will take place on Sundays from 1 to 2.30 Eastern time between March 12th and April 2nd, and the cost is $100 for the full series of four classes. So for more information about what he'll cover during that workshop, please check out the programs and events section of our website. I'll also put that link in the chat. And if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, at the end of the talk, Madeline will read your questions to David. We'll cover as many as we have time for. Um, and also we're recording this talk. So if you would like to watch it again at a later date, or if you would like to share it with someone else, you can head to our YouTube channel and I'll add that link to the chat as well. So without further ado, please welcome David Cook. Thanks, uh, Maria. Um, I hear, um, see that one person has a, an audio problem. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, let me go ahead and share. And you all should see now a big green slide says the evolution and inspiration of a nature photographer. That look good for everybody? Good. Well, um, thanks uh, Maria and, and the staff at RTPI for, for having me. It was, I was really excited and, and thrilled to be part of the exhibit uh, this summer, uh, Art That Matters to the Planet. And I'm gonna show just a couple of um, slides from some of the photographs that I have there and then get into uh, in, into my talk. So I mentioned avian apparitions and this came, I, I, I've been a bird photographer for several years and I began wanting to capture birds in a different way. But before I, I sort of dive into the birds, I wanted to share um, a motivational quote that I think inspires a lot of my photography um, today. It's from uh, Rachel Carson. It's her book, The Sense of Wonder, which was something that she wrote for her grandnephew when he was young. And it was about trying to instill a, a, a sen and find and instill a sense of wonder in the natural world. If I had the influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial the alienation from the sources of our strength. And I've got this quote on my website, website and I, I, she, the way that she talks about um, the sense of wonder that she, she has found and stills in others, something that I hope to do with, with, with my photography. So um, I'm gonna start with four of these images that were um, from the exhibit this summer. This is, uh, um, all of these are, birds that are captured in slow motion. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, a little later in the presentation. But I really enjoyed how um, displaying the birds this way gave a better sense of motion to the birds. It created sort of these ghostly-like images, which, um, you know, 
why I called them avian apparitions. So this was a, a roseate spoonbill and, and a white ibis. Both of those were taken in uh, um, Texas near High Island. And this is a, uh, um, uh, a snowy egret or a cattle egret taken here in Austin, Austin Texas. I really like the sort of the ballet like motion uh, of this. This was in um, near a rookery in Taylor, Texas, which is here in, in central Texas. And just just a seagull, but um, a gull with arching wings and, and um, I felt this captured the motion of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the evolution of my photography and sort of how I got to some of these photos. Let me begin, begin with this quote from John Muir, uh, keep close to nature's heart and break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods, wash your spirit clean. A lot of my photography began with um, what I call classic landscape photographs. Um, we was in, I was in a beautiful location and the, um, the landscape, the scenery called to me. So I, I, I took a snapshot and, and these were things that I, I consider like beautiful photos, nice postcards, but not necessarily ones that were in great light um, or that I, I worked hard to get. This was at, um, at Glacier Bay. This is the um, Green River Overlook and Canyonlands National Park. The Horseshoe Bend of the Colorado River above the Grand Canyon. Um, I recognize one person on the call who certainly will know what this is. This is Mount Rainier uh, reflecting in uh, a mountain lake and the Grand Tetons in the um, Oxbow, uh, the Snake River. So all of these were sort of, you know, classic landscape photos. I, I, in some ways I call them my postcard photos. They were beautiful images, but I didn't have to necessarily work hard for them. And they were just, I was there when the light happened to be what it was. I didn't seek out these photographs um, at a particular time of day. This is the first photograph that I said I, I, I kind of worked for. So this is in Monument Valley and it's in Northern Arizona. And there are classic images, you've probably seen these in old Westerns. But there's a, uh, uh, a different view of Monument Valley from an area that's called Hunts Mesa. And you have to get Navajo guides to take you up to Hunts Mesa. And with a couple of my photographer friends, we, uh, um, got some guides and, you know, took the long drive up to Hunts Mesa, about two hours to get there. It took us four hours because we got uh, um, caught in the sand and had to uh, get uh, out of the sand dunes. And ultimately got up there at sunset, but it was really cloudy and overcast, so it wasn't good light. But after a very, very cold night in the... Uh, um, in a tent, got up early in the morning and, and found some better light. So I think about this as one of the first photos where I was trying to be at a particular location at a particular time to take advantage of the light. And one of the things I began to learn also seeking out the light was um, I'm more of a sunrise person than a sunset person. And the, the light before sunrise is, I think, some of my favorite. This is uh, Monument Valley from the other direction, two nights after that photo, uh, about 30 minutes before sunrise uh, in Monument Valley. This is also about 30 minutes before sunrise in Big Bend National Park with the, the sun uh, lighting up the sky to the east. And then I began to play a little bit with black and white in the landscapes. And I'm really a fan of White Sands National Monument and Great Sands Dunes. So these are images that I took there that ex accentuated the sand and the wind and the light. This is at White Sands. And this is at, at, at Great Sand Dunes. And 
And then there's a world of little things seen all too seldom. Some of nature's most exquisite handiwork is on a miniature scale. So my eye began to be um, drawn to the more intimate sides of the landscape or the smaller things. This is a, a small uh, paintbrush in Zion National Park. While I took many photographs of the beautiful sandstone canyon walls in Zion, my eyes increasingly were drawn to some of these little details of the landscape. Or this juniper trying to find a way in uh, Bandelier National Monument. Lots of images of Antelope Canyon, which is a famous slot canyon in Northern Arizona, and the details um, and textures of the canyon walls really called to me here. As did the details and patterns of this leaf in Costa Rica. And then I started taking a look at some of the living things and their details, a dragonfly or um, a, a bee visiting a buttercup at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here in Austin, Texas. That's been one of my sort of favorite locations to, to photograph lo locally. And we'll see a number of photographs from the Wildflower Center here. Um, the details of a peacock feather. where Katie did, visiting a, a thistle again at the Wildflower Center. And I took a trip out west last year specifically to see the monarchs. Um, you know, the eastern monarchs migrate to Mexico, but there's a, a, a subspecies of western monarchs that migrate to the west coast, and there are a number of monarch preserves um, in California, and this is in Pacific Grove, California. I'm also a huge fan of waterfalls, um, and this um, description of the row, I think, speaks to, me, speaks to me as well. The finest workers in stone are not copper or steel tools but the gentle touches of air and water working at their leisure with a liberal allowance of time. Oop. So this is Nevada Falls in Yosemite, certainly not um, water working leisurely at this, but um, captured in, in the middle of the day. Or lower Yosemite Falls in, in, in black and white. Lower Yellowstone Falls in Yellowstone National Park. I also enjoy capturing waterfalls at, at, a, at a slower shutter speed. And in this case, um, this happened to be a waterfall that was in Olympic National Park in the Quinault Rainforest. And I took this about um, three or four months after I got my uh, first uh, digital SLR camera. And I was trying to set up in the creek below this waterfall. I put my tripod there. And while I was waiting to put the camera on the tripod, I lost my balance, fell into the water. I braced myself with my right hand, but I was smart. I had my camera in my left hand. And while I fell, my left hand went like this, up in the air. So my camera stayed dry. I got soaking wet, but my camera was dry. And I ultimately ended up a shot like, uh, uh, like this. Uh, another waterfall um, near uh, Mount Rainier National Park, near the Paradise Lodge in, uh, in Washington. I mentioned um, the Wildflower Center here, and while I certainly enjoyed and always do tra enjoy traveling, um, I was looking for beauty close to home, and the, the spring wildflowers here in Texas um, really fit that bill. My heart found its home long ago in the beauty, mystery, order, and disorder of the flowering earth. Lady Bird Johnson is um, sort of a, a, a big feature, a big, big uh, personality here in, in Austin and the Wildflower Center, her namesake, is a, is a wonderful place to photograph. And our, our 
Texas State wildflower, blue bonnets. Uh, so this is a lady beetle visiting a blue bonnet. But even when I did travel, I, my eyes were again drawn to some of the wildflowers. And this is at that trillium in the uh, Upper Peninsula in Michigan. A bluebell uh, here in Texas. And there's a little story behind this um, photograph. I was working on a project, which if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll share uh, a few photos from. But it's a project of taking photographs of, of words from nature that were removed from a dictionary for children. And bluebell was one of those words. And there were cultivated bluebells in a number of places, but I wanted to find a picture of a wild bluebell. So I turned to um, a site called iNaturalist. Some of you may be familiar with iNaturalist. It's a sort of a both a, uh, an app and a website, like social media for naturalists. I, I say that with uh, some reservation because social media has, has positive and negative connotations, um, but it can help people identify what they're seeing. Um, it, it can also help you find where other people have seen things. In this case, what I did was I turned to iNaturalist and looked up where other people were seeing bluebells near me. And I found a field about 10 miles north of us. And that's where I ended up taking this photograph um, of a bluebell. Cone flower, again, at the Wild Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And then I experimented with taking some of these wildflowers into a, a little makeshift studio in the house, just lighting them in, against a black background. This is what's called a wine cup and a, a bird of paradise. And my, my namesake flower, old man's beard, uh, which is just beautiful when it goes to seed. And I really liked the, um, the shape and texture uh, and feel of this um, in, in the studio. So I moved on from wildflowers and I started experimenting with photographs where I took sort of multiple images and used software to stitch them together into one photograph. This is one of my early uh, panoramic um, experiments. It's really easy to do this now with our, um, our smartphones. A lot of you have probably just done a pano with a smartphone. This was way back before we could do that in the smartphones. So this was three photos, one here, a second here and a third here on the right, which I stitched together using software to get this panorama of the uh, Red Rock country in Northern New Mexico. Um, I also saw this full rainbow as we were driving back uh, across New Mexico to Texas. And again, I used a panorama to stitch three different photographs together to get this full rainbow over the plains. And I took the wildflowers outside and did a panorama here. So this is what um, a field of wildflowers looks like here on, on a good wildflower season here in Texas with the blue bonnets and the paintbrush. So I also experimented with um, taking multiple photographs of the same scene, but with different exposures to do what's called high, dyna high dynamic range or HDR photographs. Um, this is a um, photograph from Santa Elena Canyon at Big Bend at sunrise. And it's actually three different photographs, one which is sort of close to properly exposed, one that's a little overexposed and one that's a little underexposed. The underexposed one brings out the details of the sky, the overexposed ones bring it down the, the or bring up the details of the the foreground. And when you combine those, you get a greater range of tones throughout your photograph. This also happens to be one of those photographs that I had to work for. Um, we were, we had to drive, got up at five o'clock, drove the Maverick Road, which is a dirt road for about 20 miles to get to this point right here on the river. By the way, this is the Rio Grande and flowing into the Rio Grande from the right is Terlingua Creek. Well, Terlingua Creek normally doesn't have water in it, 
But on this morning, um, it was about knee to thigh deep. But we were not to be deterred. We saw the beautiful sunrise coming. So we waded across Tolingo Creek with our tripods and cameras on our, uh, um, held above our heads and hiked back into the canyon. And we all set up our tripods here to shoot back into sunrise. And this is for a photo workshop that, that we had taken there. Similarly, also in Big Bend, three photographs taken together to um, get a, a high dynamic range version of what's called the window in, in Big Bend National Park. So let me talk a little bit about some of my bird photography. Um, one reason that birds matter is that they are our last best connection to a natural world that is otherwise receding. I think there were four things that got me started with uh, photographing birds in earnest. Uh, first of all, my wife is a, a hobbyist birder, and when she would go out looking for birds, I would go with her and bring my camera. Next um, was the purchase of a long telephoto lens, which allowed me to get closer to the birds. And then um, two trips we took within a year. One was to the Galapagos Islands, and one was to South Texas. And this was um, one of my early shots in the Galapagos of three Nazca boobies. Um, I love the, the way the dad is watching the mom and feeding there. And, and this is um, South Texas. Um, South Texas is one of the few places in the US where you can see green jays. Actually, it's the only place in the U.S. So the very northern um, edge of their range. And they're magnificent birds. They just really um, are just so distinct and uh, took a lot, a lot of pictures of some of the unique birds of South Texas. And hummingbirds. So both of these hummingbirds were shot in Costa Rica. And there's an interesting story behind these. So um, we had a guy that was taking us um, through the, the different um, habitats there. And he asked us if we wanted to go up to the garden to shoot hummingbirds. And I said, oh, of course. So we went up to the garden and there were about 20 different hummingbird feeders there. And he took out some light poles and he had some clamps on those light poles. And he had cut some flowers. And on each of those clamps, he put these flowers. He took down all the hummingbird feeders and then sprayed each of these flowers with sugar water. So now all of the hummingbirds, rather than attracted to the feeders, were attracted to these flowers, which provided a much, um, I, I think, a much more enjoyable photographic view of the hummingbirds. Uh, this was an osprey hunting over a, a, a lake in Utah, and I really liked um, this treatment in black and white. So that's why I was experimenting with black and white in this um, close-up of the osprey. And I mentioned a telephoto lens was really, you know, he was probably, I don't know, 50 yards away or so, and I've cropped this to get a close-up, closer-up view of the of the osprey. We have a preserve here in Austin called Mayfield Preserve. And they have there are several peacocks there. So I go each spring to get my dose of the, the local peacocks. A roseate spoonbill in South Padre Island. And here I was patient. Um, I probably sat at, uh, much to my wife's chagrin at the spoonbill for about 30 minutes uh, photographing away and finally got this shot of him cleaning uh, with the, the water moving, which I really enjoyed. Also patient with this uh, snowy egret fishing at a local state park, probably took uh, 30 minutes to, to get this, this particular shot. What's interesting about this location, I don't wanna say about this particular egret, but I went here in May of 2021 um, to a particular spot over uh, the falls here at McKinney Falls State Park and watch the snowy egret fish for um, an hour or so. Uh, it's the first weekend in May of 2021. 
first weekend in May of 2022, I went back there, snowy egret fishing. Don't know, it wasn't banded. I don't know if it was the same snowy egret, but in the exact same spot, exact same time a year later. I began really becoming interested in photographing some of the more endangered species that are um, visible here in Texas. So this was a whooping crane enjoying its favorite uh, meal of a blue crab. And closer to home, we have uh, golden cheek warblers, which are a endangered species and are protected in a by a nat National Wildlife Refuge close to uh, Austin, Texas. They breed here in Texas, and um, for folks who have you know no Texans, um, being a native Texan is supposed to be special. And because the birds breed here, we like to say that all of the golden cheek warblers are native Texans. This was a shot that um, sort of um, got everyone's emotions and fear running high. This is a large alligator that frequents a uh, birding center in, in Port Aransas. And that's a, a gallinule there in the foreground staring down um, the, uh, the alligator. And all birds were safe from this. I mentioned the ladybird Johnson wildflower several times. This is an um, an owl that, that breeds there, nests there, it's named Athena, and it's been nesting at the same location for uh, eight or nine years now. A uh, reflection of a, a great blue heron. Sandhill crane from Bosque del Apache. A tricolored heron down um, at South Padre Island. And a great blue heron, also from South Padre Island. And a couple more sandhill cranes from Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. So this is uh, how I, I began shooting birds. And you know, over time, I, I, I got better. I got better action. Um, but I was still finding, trying to find some different ways to represent um, birds. This has nothing to do with birds, but it ends up it ends up being an important photograph that takes me to um, the avian apparitions. This was an accident, a happy accident that happened at Zilker Botanical Garden here in Austin years ago. Um, and there there were a, a tulip garden, and tulips were blowing in the wind, and I shot it out of focus accidentally. And I went back and I I. I go, wow, this is kind of interesting. Um, so I could barely see some of the shapes of the tulip and just the colors said spring to me. And what I, what, it, what I did is I experimented with different ways to photograph things where they may not have been completely in focus. These were, uh, a, uh, it's a flower here, it's called the Indian blanket. And Again, not fully in focus, but you get a little bit of the sense of the flowers in bloom. This is a, a Texas thistle, also not completely in focus, but I really like the texture that you got around the edge. And I also experimented with different types of focus. So this is a photograph that was taken um, at about five seconds. Half of the photograph was in focus and half of the photograph was not in focus. And that um, combination of in focus and out of focus gives it this um, sort of fuzzy like feel, makes a dreamy rather than fuzzy. So I mentioned that project that I was working on with words that have been moved from the dictionary and dandelion was one of those words. And I did a series of different dandelion photographs. So a dandelion in bloom, um, a dandelion in seed with a dandelion in bloom behind that. This was a dandelion in seed, and I shot through that, but focused on the dandelion in bloom behind that. So again, that's two dandelions, but the white sort of fuzzy thing in front is the dandelion in seed out of focus. Um, also a dandelion in seed, but with different focus. black and white experiment. And then I also 
tried um, some multiple exposures where I took um, two shots um, to create one image. And this is, a, again, a dandelion in, in bloom and one in seed. And then experimented with some of those multiple um, multiple uh, exposures with some different things. At the preserve I mentioned where we had these peacocks, there are also these sable palms. And the sable palms have this fan-like um, leaf. And I really thought it was interesting to combine the fan-like leaf of the sable palm with the image of the peacock there at, the, at this location. So really there are two things there that are represented in this photo. And then I also experimented with multiple exposures of birds. This is a blue winged teal at a, um, a birding center in uh, Padre, uh, Port Aransas, Texas, excuse me. Then I experimented moving the camera. This is, um, this is a trendy um, thing now. It's called ICM for intentional camera movement where people move the camera during the exposure. You've seen probably lots of different images if you Look at photographs on Instagram. People are making fuzzy things and moving the camera. These are some trees. Aspen trees, again, with moving the camera. Um, moving the camera in a different way with a swirl of wildflowers. Redwoods uh, in Big Sur. But ICM, intentional camera movement, felt like it was sort of too popular and trendy. So I wanted to try something different. So I tried um, IFM, intentional foot movement. I would hike and I would hike down a trail and I would just hold my camera in front of me, set it for a long exposure, two to four seconds and walk down the trail. And rather than creating the motion with the camera, I'd create the motion with my feet. And this happened to be a trail in, uh, in the, the Woodlands, Texas. Uh, this is uh, along the Calf Creek Trail in Grand Escalante National Monument. There was green um, horsetail ferns here in the foreground, and these were yellow cottonwoods uh, in, in, in the background. This is a famous photo from Chaco Canyon where there are ruins and you can walk through those. And I've taken a number of photos, but in this case, I decided to actually walk through why shooting the, the, uh, the shot. Uh, and here's some, some of the, the fall color. I'll put fall color in air quotes for all of my people uh, in New York who have real fall color. Um, but again, I was just walking toward the lake, IFM, intentional foot movement. So all of that, experimenting with birds, experimenting with moving the camera, that sort of led me to this work that I began with, um, the avian apparitions. Um, and I need to certainly quote Roger Tory Peterson, birds have wings, they're free, they have the kind of mobility people, many people envy. So this is how I started the series. This was like the very first photograph that I took and what I did we were down at Padre Island and I was experimenting with, um, I said, Let, let's pan with the birds. And panning is where you just move the camera in motion with an object that's in motion. And ideally, you're supposed to have what you're tracking be somewhat clear um, and the background be um, sort of blurry or in motion. But I was shooting this against a, a sky, so there wasn't going to be any motion captured there. But I really enjoyed what it did to the birds. And it's began to show the birds in a different way for me. There's another early one from that series. And what I liked about this was not so much that it showed bird, but I just loved the, the sweeping arc of this wing here. And this curve really captured the, um, the, the, the motion of these um, wings in flight. So, excuse me, I experimented more. Um, people here in Austin, um, we have tons and tons of great tailed grackles, which are not popular birds, um, but this happens to be a great tailed grackle, again, shot very slowly, panning with it. And also, I think a grackle, which looked a little bit like an x ray to me initially. But these were early attempts at trying to 
um, get better at this technique of capturing birds in flight. And here I begin to show some of the ones that were in our, the series um, that was on this. And this is a, a, a crested caracara. And a pelican. And a blue winged teal. Each of these has converted to black and white because I really wanted the emphasis to be not on any colors or background but just the essence of the bird and its wings in motion. Uh, a sandhill crane. And this is um, a, a, a domestic goose, which is, I think, um, otherwise a little bit more boring, but I love the, the, the motion of the wings across the water. and um, a great egret. So definitely not a bird, um, but there's a connection here. So um, there is a, a sunflower uh, farm near us here in Central Texas. And uh, went up a couple years ago to uh, take photographs, walk through the sunflower farm, and took this photograph of the uh, sunflower and the sun coming through this. And on the way back from this, my wife and I were driving down the highway, and we saw a couple of birds, a couple of egrets. And we pointed them out, and then I drove a little further and saw some trees through a couple of buildings. And it was there was a rookery there were hundreds and hundreds of egrets. So I've been back to that rookery probably half a dozen times since this. And I connect this, all of these next photographs, which are the birds in flight, with my photograph here of the sunflower, because I, I wouldn't have discovered that rookery without the trip to the sunflower field. So these are egrets all taken up from that rookery. Some are black and white, some are remain in the original color, which is sort of the, in the green background. Also this black and white, but again, egret from that same rookery. Spoonbills, um, I love I love me some spoonbills. I will, I will shoot them wherever I can. Um, this happens to be at a rookery of egrets and spoonbills in High Island um, near Houston. And a snowy egret closer to home. So these are some um, the photographs that I'm continuing in this same series. Sandhill Crane at Bosque del Apache. But there are not always birds around here, so I've begun doing butterflies. Whoops. Let me, let me, uh, let me hold on that. Hold on butterflies. I got to talk about this series real quickly. So um, there's a local pond near us, has lots of ducks, mallard ducks, northern, northern shovelers. And one day I was shooting. Uh, photographing the ducks, and the light lit up this mallard's feathers in a way that just just really sort of yelled at me. So I, I got a close-up of, of the mallard's feathers, but then I wanted to zoom in a little bit more to get a, a closer look at the details and colors of the feather, but that wasn't enough for me. I really wanted to repeat the patterns, so I ended up creating this series of photographs, which are feathers from the birds, close up, revealing the details of the birds, but I reflect them in Photoshop. So this is done post-processing and editing, but it's all close-ups of bird feathers, repeated and reflected. And this happens to be a mallard. Here's a wild turkey, close-up feather of the wild turkey, the, pat, the color and patterns of the wild turkey close up, reflected. Gamble's quail right here is what I was focused on. Got a little closer on that and created this. 
I like this because it repeats this pattern. And I don't want that to be part of, uh, to make sure people see that. So white-faced ibis, the feathers of the white-faced ibis close up, and that white-faced ibis reflected. Now, let me talk quickly about the butterflies. We don't, I don't always have birds here, um, or at least we do, but not always ones that I want to photograph. So in the past couple of years, I've really been enjoying photographing the butterflies. I mentioned we going to the, went to the Monarch Sanctuary um, in uh, Pacific Grove, California. This happened to be further down the coast at Pismo Beach. The butterflies love the wild, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and I love the butterflies at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. This is a, a called a golf fritillary, um, and uh, a queen, and back, uh, pipe vine swallowtail. So I'm I've been taking a naturalist class, and um, pipe vine swallowtail is one of the early I, butterflies I learned ID, and one of the ident identifying marks is these seven orange spots right here on the pipe vine swallowtail. So then I experimented with some of those other techniques with butterflies. So this is a multiple exposure of a butterfly opening and closing its wings um, on um, mist flower, Greg's mist flower, which the butterflies love and experimenting with some of that same reflection technique of butterfly wings. All right, I've got just like three or four more minutes. I wanna show um, this last piece of work and then um, save time for questions. I've mentioned this work a couple of times um, and I, um, uncover I discovered this by reading a book by Terry Tempest Williams. Uh, her book was called The Hour of Land, and it's about uh, the national parks. And late in that book, she um, talks about um, something that has actually occurred two or three years uh, prior, where, where these words, words from nature, um, words like eggcorn and bluebell, were removed from a dictionary for children in the UK, the Oxford Junior Dictionary. And I learned a little bit more about this, um, specifically from Robert McFarlane, who's a, a uh, on the faculty at Cambridge, I believe, and is a, a, a UK author who's written wonderful works. And um, he wrote a, a book called Landmarks, which is about um, different places in the UK. And then he wrote a book called The Lost Words, uh, which is about these specific words. And I, during COVID, um, I had, uh, didn't have as much to do, so I took on a project to photograph some of these lost words. Once upon a time, words began to vanish from the language of children. They disappeared so quietly that at first no one noticed, fading away like water on stone. The words were those that children used to name the natural world around them. The words were becoming lost, no longer vivid in children's voices, no longer alive in their stories. Eggcorn. Clover, fern, heron, kingfisher, pelican, poppy, thrush, violet. Ren, all words removed from the dictionary. And that's, I think, more, more a, a symptom than um, the, uh, the illness, say, the symptom being our distancing from the natural world. And that's really one of the things that inspired me to submit some of my work to Art That Matters to the Planet last year was doing something with my photography that would, um, I think, make a difference and, and 
I close with my quote again from Rachel Carson. If I had influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantment of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. So that's some of my inspiration and a little bit evolution of what I've what my photography has been over the past sort of 30 years as a photographer. I'm going to go ahead and stop share and handle any questions that there may be. All righty. Well, hi. So um, a couple of questions did come through. The first one being going back to your black and white hummingbird. Um, can you talk a little bit if, um, about your shutter speed examples um, through your progression as well as if you've used a lot of flash with that as well? Sure. Um, I, I don't use flash um, on any of my, well, I, I don't, I generally don't use flash. I, I, there may be a couple exceptions. Um, the hummingbirds, um, I, I'm, my shutter speeds vary. Some have been as slow as one eight hundredth to one one thousandth of a second. Generally, they're one two thousandth to one four thousandth of a second. Um, most of the photographs that I've done of the, the slow motion of the birds, they vary from about one fourth of a second to as fast as maybe one fifteenth of a second. It depends a lot on the type of bird, um, how close I am to the bird. So all of that, that avian apparitions and those birds, they vary in that range, but it's generally, so just yesterday, I was out um, photographing uh, birds um, at, a, at a local lake here and an osprey flew over. And um, I quickly, went down to one tenth of a second immediately because that's sort of my starting point on trying to capture birds um, in that particular technique. I also wanted to get some nice clear shots of the osprey, so I had to ratchet it back up. Um, but in general, um, that's how I, um, I shoot those birds. And I'm gonna, actually I've got a whole, um, section uh, of that class I'm going to teach that talks about shutter speed and ISO and aperture and, and what I've used and, and how you can do different things for um, different um, expression of birds. Awesome, awesome. So um, another um, similar question along is along the technique that you use and they're asking, does this seem to be a more direct representation of what you're capturing or trying to capture as the as the um, so subject um, in place of IACM? Um, gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't, if I go back to that sort of that, those, that I, the ICM work, it, I'd say I, I, want the the bird work specifically to say enough about birds to um, to be visible. The ICM is, I didn't say some of it's about trees. I mean, um, so there's, a, it depends a little bit on, on what I'm shooting, how much I want it to be completely abstract, as opposed to keeping some representation of what it is I'm actually trying to, to shoot. I'm just gonna clarify in the chat that um, ICM means intentional camera movement. For anyone yes. It's uncertain of that because I, I just thought that would be a good thing to clarify. Because I didn't. Um, and then uh, when it comes to, um, those are like the two big questions in the chat right now. If anyone has any other um, big informative questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat for us. 
um, to discuss. But other than that, my, I have a curious question for you. When it comes to your travel methods and equipment and things, um, would you like to discuss? Um, you, you talked a lot about walking and hiking. Um, when it comes to different trains and things, do you have a lot of additional gear? Or I, I'm curious about what you pack. Yeah. Um, so I I I shoot with a, a, a Nikon camera um and i haven't made the trip the 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 um the switch to mirrorless yet so i'm, I'm using it uh, all this has been with nikon the more recent stuff is a nikon d850 i do have a really big pack um and it's uh it, it's barely a carry-on <laughs> so if i'm if i'm on a plane um and then when i add a tripod to that but what I often do if I'm going out, if, if I know um, I'm focusing just on birds, um, I may just bring my telephoto lens. If I know I'm going to be mostly working with the wildflowers or the butterflies, I may just bring my macro and the tripod and leave the telephoto at home. Um, so just recently when I went out on a uh, to photograph some some purple martins that are beginning to come here. I brought my telephoto and I brought my standard 24-120 zoom, but I left the macro and I left the wide angle at home. So that lightens the pack a little bit. Uh, but when um, when I, I, I do hike a little bit, I, I can carry 20 pounds of gear on there and I try not to do that often, but um, there, there can be a lot of gear. Absolutely. Well, I'm not sure if there's any more questions in the chat. So if um, while we're waiting to see if anyone has any more questions, I'll just jump in and say thank you to David Cook for being here today. Um, and you know, I um, added in the chat the link for the catalog to the Art That Matters of the Planet 2022 exhibition. So please check that out. We were so fortunate to have David's work in it. We had 10 of his photographs here. And um, I'll say it was just amazing to see visitors just um, looking at the wall of the avian apparition series and um, first of all it's just gorgeous to see them all together but also just wondering how in the world you got those photos <laughs> um so it was it was a lot of fun um to have those here and also it's it's really wonderful um to work with artists such as yourself who are so passionate about nature because i'm always learning new things um so it's it's really amazing um, to be able to work with you and um, I will mention a few things um, just that we have coming up at RTPI. Um, and I am going to add a link to all of this in the chat as well. Um, so we have Curious by Nature, Works by Charlie and Edie Harper is our current exhibition. It closes March 5th. And then we will have a new exhibition opening on March 18th with the opening um, event on March 17th from six to nine. So it's actually two exhibitions. Hope is the Thing with Feathers, Contemporary Women Nature Artists, and Alex Warnick, The Art of Observation. Um, and you can click on that to go see what those are about. Um, and then also coming up in April, we have the Banff Center Mountain Film Festival World Tour, which we're very excited about. That'll be April 21st and 22nd at the Reg Lennis Center for the Arts. Um, so we'll be hosting that. We have a lot of other fun programs and events coming up. So to see everything that we have going on, please head to rtpi.org and check it all out. And um, we hope to see you in Jamestown. Um, did we have any other questions pop up while I was chatting? There was one additional question. Um, it is in, while doing the ICM, do you move only your arms and hands? Do you practice and experiment with full body movements? Um, I think it's kind of the stylizing of that. Yeah, I am not a, I'm not a deep practicer of ICM. And um, so um, I will um, really just often just move my camera like this when I'm doing that. Now I will say with the birds, um, in that case, um, I, I guess I am moving the camera in that sense. And in that case, I'm, I'm, I'm panning. So that will be a full turn um, of my body following the bird. And if you haven't done panning before in photography, what you have to do is you find 
whatever it is that you want, want to photograph and you find it in, in the camera and you follow it and then you take the photo. You don't take the, you know, you know, get it and take the photo immediately. So what you do as you follow the bird or whatever it is, that's when you take your photograph after you've started following it. And that's the technique that you use for panning. And, and it's not a new technique at all. It's been used for, you know, as long as photography has been around. But with, um, when you start doing it, I think that that's people sort of um, don't begin uh, by following early enough with whatever that they want to, um, to photograph. Thank you, I think that's everything. Yeah, thank you again um, to David and thank you to everyone for joining us um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you all. Bye.